Okay, so Tuesday, 13th of June, uh, Open Source Andy Burdick's Moore Ligase meeting. Um, there is an agenda online, which you hang very kindly posted. And I just uh, tweaked a little bit. Um, I guess there, there are still, you know, the same um, major items that we're dealing with. And the the big one was the ongoing screen of the enumin compounds. And Adrian, you shared a slide deck very kindly um, the other day. I guess from my perspective, it would be great if you would be happy to walk through that and give us what you found. If you're happy to. You're still muted, sorry. Sorry. Look at that. Right. I can share the slides if it's mm -hmm. technically tricky. No. Right. You can hear me now? Yep. Right. Can't see slides, but you can hear you. <laughs> right, bear with me. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Right. Okay, so I've basically gone um, back to the work we've done with enemy library with the seed manager of Genosa Enzyme and um, gone through and looked carefully at everything that we've done. So basically, in the beginning, um, we received the enemy library, all 676 members of it, the fragments, fragments um, distribute. Audio is breaking up for me. I don't know about anybody else. It's... Yeah. Adrian, your bandwidth's a bit dodgy. Are you in Birmingham? Uh, um, a uh, right. Uh, well, I'll try. Uh, I'll, can you hear me at all? Yeah, I can hear you. But it was it's very not... fragmented. Have you got a microphone problem or a bandwidth problem? I don't think I've got a bandwidth problem particularly. Um, wait a minute. Maybe the microphone is very directional. So just make sure you find the spot and kind of keep there, so to speak. I'm pretty close to my laptop at the moment, which I'm more or less yelling at. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, basically, we employed, have employed two assays to um, look at uh, the uh, inhibitory impact of the compounds in this library. Um, the first of which is a spectrophotometric one, which I've called A. Uh, which simply uses a single coupling enzyme and a chromogenic nucleoside called methylthioguanosine, which phosphate cleaves in the presence of pure nucleoside phosphorylase and gives you an absorbance change at 360. Uh, the second um, assay is a 10 microliter fluorometric version of it, uh, where we're using two extra coupling enzymes um, xanthine oxidase and um, high, uh, HRP, uh, horse rage peroxidase, mm -hmm. and we couple that to the conversion of ample extract to the fluorophore uh, resorufin. Right. Okay, so this is the assay we deployed for the enemy in library, and basically when we started out, it looked and looks quite promising. Um, in the top left-hand uh, figure, we have the dependence upon the assay response to MERD in the presence and absence of deglutamate, and she shows the expected response. And below that, we have a time course, again, which shows very nice discrimination uh, between it and the negative minus amino acid control. Um, and when we tried our standard inhibitor, which is ADPCP, we would get very good discrimination between inhibited and uninhibited uh, assays with Z primes of around about 0.76. So this is the stopped assay. I hasten to add the stopped assay that we went 
and then they probed the entire enemy line with this. Okay, am I still coming through in bits or can you hear me okay? It's okay. Right. <laughs> okay, so in the figure I've labeled A is the entire um, library data. Uh, in other words, percentage inhibition for all compounds. The red bar towards the right hand side of that is the response of our standard ATPCP. And then what we did is we triaged the uh, any compound that gives an inhibition of greater than 50%. That left us with 124 compounds, which is a strikingly high proportion of the library. Uh, just under 19 percent. So given that the assay which I've now drawn out on the left hand side called stop discontinuous assay has um, two, sorry, three enzyme linking steps, um, there is the obvious question as to whether many of these compounds are hitting the coupling system. Um, now if you look at the right hand side with the two histograms the one in purple which looks at the response of the discontinuous assay that we used in the library to loss of coupling enzyme activity essentially that assay has an issue with any loss of coupling enzyme activity because that is reflected in the final result curiously enough if you run the assay continuously which you can do um, then the impact of loss of coupling enzyme activity is a lot, lot less. Nevertheless, the position we're in is that we ran the enamine library screen with a stopped discontinuous assay with the compounds at half millimolar. And so what we then did was we tested the coupling enzyme system against all of the enamine hits we got that were giving in excess of 50%. Now, the graph on the top right, um, so the dark red uh, bars are the, con the impact of the compounds on the inhibition of the coupling system. The bars in blue are the actual MERD, in inverted commas, data that we got. And what was fairly clear is that of all the screening that we'd done, only 11 or so compounds could we actually say hand on heart were not artifacts of coupling enzyme inhibition. That left about 113 compounds um, whose activity may or may not be um, impacted on MERD, and that's an awful lot of chemical equity to throw away. So, um, sorry, Adrian, this is Joe. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when you refer to interference in the coupling assay, is that uh, spectroscopic interference or is that actually could be actually inhibition of the, uh, these fragments in, in inhibiting the coupling enzymes? I mean, in terms of a specific, a specific inhibition of the coupling enzymes as opposed to a spectroscopic fluorescence or some other uh, interference. It's, uh, I believe, mostly, um, or certainly in large part, it's due to inhibition of the coupling system that I was using. When, so, yeah, so again, so again, when you say inhibition of the coupling system, I mean, these are fragments. So I guess I'm, I guess my question is, you know, if, if it's inhibiting the coupling enzyme, does that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't inhibit near D? That's correct. That's entirely correct. So, okay. so. See, if I work through the points, I've got in that sort of yellow box. So we know that the tolerance of the assay is low to a loss of coupling enzyme activity. Uh, we of the 124 would actually get through. Um, we, which may or may not be inhibited um, by the uh, compounds we were testing them against. Um, and the fourth point is that in an assay with multiple components, the more components you have, the more liability you have to interference in any of those coupling steps. And also, um, 
The fifth point is the situation is exacerbated by the nature of the library. So the compounds are fragments. So it appears that to expect clean discrimination uh, against of target activity is probably asking a little much for molecules of this sort of size. So what we did, we basically, sixth point, um, sort of simpler method of assay of the fragments that we uh, suspected might actually be MERDI inhibitors. Now, essentially, what we can do, um, if we just run the assay with pyrinucleoside phosphorol, well, there's no other coupling enzyme, and we use methyl thiamine guanosine, whose cleavage by phosphate generates a signal at 360. We have a, a number of advantages. There's no possibility of fluorescence quenching. It's simpler, so there are less potential liable targets uh, for off-target inhibition. Um, and it's contamination. This is it's a spectrophotometric assay. It requires five times the volume, um, and it therefore requires five times the amount of reagents. It's lower sensitivity, although it, that's good for phosphate contamination, means that we have to increase the amount of MERDI in the assay. Um, and the near UV, UV wave and invites interference by other compounds who will have absorbances in that area. So nevertheless, we persisted because with this Adrian, we're losing you again. If we look at its sensitivity, up to the Okay. Uh, where have you got to? <laughs> Uh, the blue text. Um, I don't know what's happening, whether there's a, a bad connection with, do you have a separate microphone or is it a built-in microphone? No, it's a built-in microphone. Okay. Um, okay, so, so to recapitulate, with this particular coupling system, we could lose 50% of the coupling enzyme activity um, without having any impact upon the MERDI activity we were assaying. So that seemed a better bet. So on this slide, we have the results of employment of this particular assay. In the bottom panel, we have the 124 compounds from the original enamine screen. That's the original enamine data. In the panel above, we have the same set compounds assayed with the simpler MERDI assay system. Um, and We've had in brown R6 and also uh, LO6, which we identified before. So we're going to take everything above 50%. We wind up with 21 compounds that actually now um, fall into that bracket. So now we're down to 3.1% of the entire library. If then we screen those compounds with the coupling enzyme alone, just PMP, um, we're left with uh, essentially 13 compounds, which have now made it all the way through. They've made it through the fluorescent assay originally, and they've made it through uh, a secondary MERDI assay, and now they've made it through the coupling enzyme screen. And that gives us, in the end, these 11 compounds. Now, the table on the right-hand side, the table on the right-hand side, um, there is the assay data for inhibition by the ample X-ray assay compared to the inhibition by the simpler PMP single coupling enzyme assay. So if you look down that list, um, in the ample X-ray assay, all of, of the compounds which were inhibitors all inhibited the coupling and on that basis and the PMP couple. Um, most of those compounds were actually uh, made it through. In other words, the coupling enzyme inhibition was less than 50%. So we were looking at genuine MERDI activity. 
And that leaves us with 11 compounds on the left-hand side, in addition to JO6, MO2, and LO6, which I believe are actually genuinely active. And finally, no, I probably wouldn't do. I mean, there were challenges along the way. Um, phosphate contains UDP substrate and ATP. Um, the enemy library by its name um, did present its own set of issues, for example, compound precipitation, reaction with the components of the assay, uh, the amplex red assay. Um, substitution to a spectral photometric one didn't get us out of jail completely. There were still significant absorbance issues with many compounds. Um, the other thing, and it was, it shouldn't have been, but it was a surprise to me, is how wildly indiscriminate many of the enemy compounds actually are. Um, and that is telling because it really, really made it a real issue for the Amplex Red Assay to discriminate um, against things that were truly murdy assays. Now, you might think that I'm not a fan of the fluorescent assay anymore, but In the right place at the right time, it does have use of compounds we've been working with, with Mercy, there is no issue at all. They are very, in those assays, those compounds are selective enough to use. Even in the work I've talked about here, it may have, might have been able, it might have been possible to employ the fluorescent assay. We'd originally intended to use an ATP analog because that would bind more weakly. We didn't do it in the end, simply because the fluorescent assay gave us the ability to work at such low ATP concentrations that we could extract the same competitive advantage. If we had used a much more weakly binding ATP analog, for example, the other fragment concentrations, and that might have got around many of the problems that we saw before. Hindsight is a wonderful thing here. Um, having gone through the exercise, we, what we're now doing are the IC50s on the hits that we've got with the MESG PMP assay. Um, we don't have the facility to use the malachite green assay because the problems that its acidity creates in the actual assay with the particular. Um, if we were going to do anything more with it, we might be looking at using things like a ADP glow, luminescent assay. Okay. Finally, if I ever do this again, I think the first thing I'm ever is, is that we can't screen everything first to see where the potholes lie. And that is that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. So, um, the question is, if I may, um, so you're doing so of the 14 compounds which for which you have high confidence, you're doing a, a IC50s, is that right? Yes, that's right. And um, I, just to raise two, two other questions. One is, um, these are, of course, the enamine collection of 600 and something compounds. Um, we, given that we are making and shipping compounds related to the atomwise set, I just wondered if you were able also to evaluate the atomwise compounds in this way. Um, if there's doubt about, you know, the original data that we got using these assays. Well, well, the original atomwise data was good. Um, it was done with the amplex red assay of off target coupling enzyme inhibition was much, much, much lower oh, by okay. a long way. So okay. interestingly enough, the atomized library from that perspective and the enzymatic perspective was actually a far easier thing to deal with. And the hits that we got, we are confident of. Um, it's just that here, in the context of this library, um, the members of it, are far more 
multipotent. Okay, right. I mean, could you just go back to the slide where you had the structures of the high confidence molecules? Because I mean, there are some motifs. Yeah, I mean, there are some motifs there um, which might explain that. I mean, essentially, whenever you have an aromatic system with a sulfur and a CH2, like in FO3 and J13 and M17, I mean, some sometimes those are quite generically reactive. Um, that's not to blame them always, but sometimes you get that. And I guess the the molecular weights here are a little bit smaller than some of the atomized ones, I suppose, just a little bit, not much. Um, okay, and and then before I I stop talking because I'm sure other people might want to ask you questions. I mean, it's a huge amount of work, um, and and it's it's fantastic, and it clarifies an, an awful lot. Um, the uh, I mean, would do you in your workflow? Would you now want to ensure that you can see binding of these high confidence compounds using an orthogonal assay like SPR or something else that is not enzymatic or spectrophotometric? The it's a in a way, I'm tempted to say no, simply because. Quite often, um, because SBR looks at frank binding as opposed to actual inhibition of an enzyme activity, yeah. you can get binding without inhibition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really depends what you're after. But if if genuinely we are after active site focused molecules that have an inhibitory potency, then to my mind, unfortunately, it has to be kind of this way round. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you want to share your experience with this? It's tough. Uh, uh, um, so, um, before I answer, uh, Adrian, yeah, uh, are these values? Um, I, I didn't hear everything very well. So, are these values micromolar or millimolar or nano? <laughs> A A nineteen is it fifty three percent inhibition? Ah, all right. Percent percent inhibition of five hundred micromolar. All right. Yeah. So the thing is that the more weak, the weaker they are, the more non-specific binding you get on any other binding techniques. Um, and these don't seem to be like super good inhibitors anyway no no so if you look so if i right, okay only can you hear me so uh, let's see yeah okay i'm unmuted so if you if my understanding of the data oh went away uh that if you look at the data the mere d column on the far right we lost we lost you we lost your screen adrian I think I have the PowerPoint anyway. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I can bring, so you can bring the up. slides. So bring the slides back All right. up. Right. So that's um. Who's fastest? Right, so it's hundred percent inhibition. Sorry. Hundred percent. So. Yeah, so some of them are like ninety, greater ninety percent inhibition against MIR D, yeah. and then you want low inhibition against, as I understand it, low inhibition against the second, uh, the right hand column, the yeah. BNP. Yeah. Correct. So you yes. want you want high you want high numbers in the MIR D column, and you want low numbers in the PNP column. Precisely. Pardon. Yeah, exactly. So right. So you have a bunch of compounds there that. You know, and if you look at like M17, it's 86% inhibition at 500 micromolar against your D, but it's only inhibiting the PNP assay at 7%. So that, I think, if my interpretation of that is that that's a very, that's quote, a selective your D inhibitor. Yeah, that's So, I'd say you could start. I can't hear it, but time. Uh, we've yes. lost to Adrian. I can't. Thank I can't you. hear anything. But if 
So this is at a high concentration anyway, right? So 500 I think mic 500 have, micromol. 500 yeah, micromol. but that's that's a high concentration for me. <laughs> In my mind, uh, these are these are well, these are fragments. I mean, so you don't know what. Yeah, it, but I'm 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 talking okay, about the binding, the binding uh, for the for the binding experiments and things like that. The oh, higher for SPR. Degree, yeah, for SPR, this is a really high concentration. So I would only do it once we go the AC fifties, and then we make sure that you know, the 100% stays, and then the, the actual IC50 or inhibition is much lower than 500, right. you know. Um, and then once we got that, then those, we can definitely test them. Uh, if it's a, uh, a small number of compounds, I can even try to do competition assays on the SBR and or, or include um, ATP, for example, or well, AMP, PNP, and things like that on the buffers, because then it's a really slow volume. Uh, and sastries and things like that. Um, so we could do things later on, but I think we need to do the IC50s and make sure those numbers do not do not stay on the IC50, right? Uh, that the IC50 is far away from the 500 or 200 micromolar. You kind of hope they would if you're getting figures of around about 90 odd percent. Yeah, um, I'm hoping that. I'm I'm hoping, but I don't know if it's worth it going yeah, into that I think, I mean, <laughs> because the the sensors are three hundred pounds. So, yeah. and every time I do one experiment, right, that's it. I can't reuse it. So, well, I maybe, maybe the thing to do, maybe the thing yeah. to do is um, do the IC fifties and do them at two ATP concentrations to check that we get some indication they're on target. Right, um, and then start spending money on SPR and the like. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure I see the, see the value of doing SPR at this point, personally. I mean, I think the, what you just suggested, Adrian, with doing, you know, looking at, are these competitive or not, right? Then I see 50 yeah. and also see if they're competitive. Uh, I mean, at, yeah, at and that yeah, point, I was just saying SPR folks... because, you know, I was just talking about this because you were mentioning it, you know, you wanted my opinion on that area. But yeah. if we wanted to measure any binding, because for, for crystallography and things like that, it's more important the binding than the inhibition because we want to saturate completely. Um, so if we wanted to analyze anything like that, then yeah, I will wait until the IC50s. In terms of activity, inhibition, et cetera, obviously we don't need the um, SPR data for progressing towards getting a more active compound. We can keep going with the essay. Uh, Adrian, so I guess obviously the other question uh, I think that Matt probably thinking is, so now you have this data against your D. Um, so we're always going after multi-targeting. So I don't know where, where your things stand in terms of either MIR C or MIR E in terms of looking at these and in, in context against those two isozymes. Be frozen. Well, um, we have choices. Uh, is that we, we repeat the entire exercise again with the 50 microliter and, and turn it over. Uh, You're the, breaking up quite a bit. Hey, library with Murray. Um, or we do the panel. I just want to if you stop stop your video, see if that helps the, the yeah. voice. There's a problem, definitely. Pretty sure it's a bandwidth problem because yeah. the, the audio is going on. Yeah. Okay. So so the question was what we do next. So we 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 do have the option to um uh recycle the entire library through another ligase at five times the amount to sub Right. Or uh, we have the option to take the hits that we've got that we know actually work um, and uh, challenge the LMR ligases against those. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say take these and go after either, you know, ideally MUR C and MUR E uh, and to see if you get any inhibition. Um, yeah. Against yeah. MIR C or MIR D, excuse me, MIR C or MIR E. Yeah. Um, 
I, I would say just, I mean, you've, this is her Herculean effort you've done. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough about how persistent you've been. And um, I, I know it's it's been just an amazing amount of effort to get to this point. Um, of course, it would be great to do the full library against, you know, but I think uh, if we could get uh, some additional compounds that, that look like they're multi-targeting to try to feed into uh, especially structural biology. Um, that, that that would be my my focus recommendation. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. If you if you redid everything, I mean, well, if you do that, you run the risk of missing compounds that are active against MERC and MERE selectively. <laughs> But I think the risk of that is small compared to the amount of work that will be involved in rescreening everything. So it makes sense to go after the these existing compounds. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think right now we, we need, just need to progress the proof of principle, don't we? Yeah. You know, to persuade people to give us more money to do this. We need to show actually, yeah. you know. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe get a compound that we can actually crystallize. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how the SSGC is, is, is doing with the Yeo6, but in my experience, these compounds are not soluble. So I can't get into high concentrations for my crystallization experiments. So if we get more potent compounds, I will have to add less compound uh, onto my crystallization trials. And maybe keeping that into account for the follow-up compounds, maybe introducing something that might make them a little bit more soluble for the experiments, that would be amazing. Mm. I think we might need to prioritize that over potency just to get the structures. You know, we yeah. might need to down tune some of them one way or the other, yeah. just things into a crystal. It's becoming a big problem, and many compasses as well, they were crystallizing as well on the job. As soon as I added them, they were crystallizing or making yeah. the conditions crystallize, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's the main issue. Hmm. I mean, historically, it's what's blocked us before lack of co crystal soaking data. That's, that's blocked us previously. No. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I do have a question, Laura. I can maybe talk to you offline about it, but I, uh, we can continue on with other other uh, presentations we need to get to. That's fine. All right. Um, just to while we're on the subject of compounds, we uh, shipped. So the, the compounds that were purchased. Wait. When when was this shipment? Sorry, I forget now. Anyway, it was three weeks ago. Okay. We shipped um, these compounds. Oops. Um, yeah. Which were so that's LO6, MO2, and then a bunch of atom wise compound variants, and then variants of, comp of a compound that we'd like the look of in the, in the competition. So those have all gone to you guys are worried. Hopefully, these are useful. These, these are just simple SAR round compounds that we like mm -hmm. the look of. Okay. Yeah, we've um, got them. Yep. All right. Great. And then there were some some ones we couldn't buy anything of. So Yiwei's made uh, some variants and is continuing to do that. Um, and Eve has made some variants of this one. So again, these were atomized compounds that we liked. Uh, and Ed shipped the last two competition compounds. Um, so yeah, those are those are now with you. Um, Yiwei is looking at some other variants here, which should be better more more soluble to some extent so that's the next round of compounds she's going to make but obviously if anything comes out of these then we can focus in on um zooming in onto the structures which give uh, any any decent data mm -hmm. all right um just by the way with the competition ones these are the last two um you know that is a discrete piece of work, and as I think as we as we mentioned before, if we investigated those compounds and collated together all the methods that people used, and if we have identified anything that is binding, we can quickly get a paper out on that because it's a completely self-contained piece of work. Um, well, we've got we've got two candidates that appear to be specific um, that came out from the last meeting, so we can probably look at those as well. Yeah, it would be good to to get together and just maybe yeah. get 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 all the data together and see what what we might want to do. Yeah, um, whether we need to buy or make anything to to finish that off, kind of thing. Um, I'm just also thinking about you know publications from this group as a way of convincing people to to fund the next step, and that could be one of them. Obviously, um, crystallography paper being another, and 
uh, Yu Hang's exploration of the AZ compounds being another. If we can get some of these over the line, that will help mm. us in the future. Okay, I just wanted to flag those compounds have been shipped. Um, and then, so Laurie, yeah, you you updated us, um, I think by email that the the compound with JF6, sorry, the crystal with JF6 um, yeah. that it looked promising didn't diffract. And we had a conversation uh, with you, Bart, I think about, about shipping that to... Uh, it was shipped already. Um, okay, just it, it had been shipped a while ago by Laurie. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. But I can't remember what, what was it. Oh, Bart, we can hear you. There you go. Yeah, that's been shipped off from me to Scott now. And then they have the MER. Uh, we also have the MER D proteins uh, for mm -hmm. crystallography from, from Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. Um, we have the. Our MER E's aren't. Um, I was looking, you know, trying to figure out everything and armor ease that we've purified never crystallized like those aren't. So we're going to have to make new constructs to get a mer E. Um, but we did make the uh, mer D's for both of those. And so those will go um, into crystal trials. Just right. a question about, about the kinetics of the mer ligase is, is there any, any noticeable you know, increase in or decrease in mobility as you go CDE. You know, does, 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 is there any idea on the kind of you know, the jaw move, the domain movements? You know, well, we, is, definitely, is one we definitely, we definitely the know there's a number of publications on your D being highly dynamic. So your D, I know for sure. I, I can't speak to the other ones, but uh, definitely your D is a high, high, highly highly dynamic. I think they're all quite similar. Yeah. In terms of dynamics, yeah. Because you can find many structures um, on the very open and close. So, hmm. but I can have a look at it. Because we were just having this conversation the other day, whether, you, you, whether we ought to be trying to find something that looks like some transition analog as much as a substrate to try and capture the enzyme halfway through it, you know. Activity, you know, I don't know. I don't, why yeah. what we always fail, you know, we've we been going for something the, that people have made these things. Mm. People have made um, transition state analogs with the tetrahedral center, um, where you're supposed to have, to have nucleophilic attack between, them. and it turns out that they are nanomolar molecules. It also turns out that. They are. They have no activity in a biological sense at all because they're they're still highly charged and and they are impossible to get through membranes. Um, but there, there are some very very nice analogs out there for uh, purely in vitro enzymatic work, mainly done by the French in the sort of mid nineteen nineties. So yeah, so we can look into that into getting some co crystals with that. We can also look into yeah. doing mutations for stabilizing conformations as well. So my 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 suggestion, I guess, we're, since we're talking about this right now, so I think one of the the issues, you know, I guess Laura, you talk about the limited solubility of compounds. I mean, I I know every enzyme system is different, but I mean, there's been so much work done. I've been involved with in in the kinase space, where kind kind most of the kinase Lead generation, which lead lead material, is highly insoluble. They're 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 and they, they, they work very hard to actually solubilize a lot of these kinase inhibitors, but they get many structures for those. So one so one one I, I think we I've talked about this before, but I'm gonna bring it up again. So I'm just wondering in terms of a, a back soaking experiment. So uh, if you took something like um, whatever what's it, adenine. With the ribose, just the ribose. So if you look at like the crystal structures, one of the, of your D, the ribose hydroxyl groups interact with the acid group and kind of help tie down the flexible domain. But that compound should be relatively uh, weak binding. So if you had crystals with that bound, 
and then do more of a, a back soaking and not putting. So I guess this other thing about, I guess it's what's a vapor deposition. What's that? I forget what that term is where you you're basically through uh, what's that, that equilibrium where you have something at a high concentration and then it basically the, the, the molecules get carried over into vapor the diffusion. Into, yeah. So, I mean, how I mean, I don't know if Scott's can do that or, or, but, but trying that where you have these insoluble compounds. But secondly, I think having something bound in the ATP site, um, so something weak. So I think if you just take adenine with the ribose, that molecule itself, um, not with the phosphates on it, but just the ribose itself. Uh, that might be enough to help stabilize some of uh, the other domain. And then can you back soak in? Because some, that, that compound, I, I don't know what the activity of it's going to be, but some of these compounds that we have, based on uh, Adrian's work, these are, you know, say 100 micromolar or 50 micro. Some of these compounds are in the, you know, lower micromolar range. So I'm just wondering if you can compete back out, um, you know, something that's bound, you know, weaker bound uh, ATP analog. So uh, that's one thing I would I think might be worth trying in this situation. Yeah, but if the compounds itself are aggregating on the crystallization condition or even crystallizing, you don't, don't get so don't, bound okay, to I just, I, Yeah, so I, this is why I, I, I know those are your observations and that's what's happening. I just, yeah. I'm a little, I'm just a little, confused about because again just sorry with other systems so how do you get around getting these structures of this is a different system yeah, crystallization conditions as well um there are many factors that why this these compounds might not be uh, behaving on the on the drop um mm. that i don't know what what systems are you looking into if you remember, if you remember later, you can send me the the links to the PDB, and I can have a look. What are the crystallization conditions? But uh, many times it's just they have a more or better solubilization condition for the crystallization. Our conditions are not really good for solubilizing compounds. And I'm trying to get new crystallization conditions on the Miller cases, but I'm not able to. So mm. it's a mixture of compounds not being soluble enough on that range of conditions plus the crystals not wanting to grow in something else. And when well, I managed to grow it in something else, like with DO6, the diffraction was not good enough. Well, I couldn't collect data. Right, right. Laura, can you can you um, just put them, can you effectively put them into a different buffer system once they're grown? Yeah, That's I tried that there. and they 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 just disintegrate. All apart. Mm. Um if if I mean it's it's a wild, it's a wild guess. But if we if we knew what the conditions were for the co crystallization, co Adrian, do you want to switch your video off again? Much as I enjoy seeing you, the <laughs> my days with ATP, and we know, or at least we think we know. <laughs> you too, Chris. There we go. Yeah, much okay, better. Right. Better. Much better. Yeah. What were you saying, Adrian? We couldn't hear. Well, it is relevant. So, what what I was what I was thinking was, so we're going along with the supposition based upon some evidence that the not here. No, I think I think you need to. Right make so I only I also on. saw poor solubilization in the SPR buffer as well. So, so um, I was wondering whether it's worth actually establishing this. <laughs> what I was going to say, Adrian, <laughs> why don't you run over, I was to gonna say... run over to the main building where Laura is, <laughs> rather than your outpost, because we can't hear you. Yeah, it's just a delay. It's just a delay on the audio. So it's a band bandwidth problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So I also noticed when I was preparing the compounds for um, SPR in the previous runs, right? They also aggregate while you try to delete the mud relatively higher concentrations um, and I did different dilutions to try to get no aggregation at all for preparing things for the soaking and co-crystallization as well uh, for co-crystallization is the normal buffers right and they are still not uh, soluble at high concentration so I cannot go I cannot test the compounds at really high concentrations without um, 
aggregating the compounds. Uh, so for example, I can go to one to two molar radius very easily, but I can't go higher without aggregating something, either the compound or the protein. Or the protein. So that limits a lot the experiment. Because when you have uh, these uh, macromolar binders, um, meat macromolar binders, you want to have a big uh, radio, like one, two, three, probably. Or at least I like to have it. I have more success getting to one to three, closer to one to three than one to two. One to two usually works better for better uh, inhibitors. So I guess what we're saying is perhaps we need to wait till we get the next round of compounds. Yeah, we next build round it, of compounds. We build in potency and solubility. Yeah, hopefully they will Maybe be more potent. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of both <clears> things. So because potency, getting them more potent will help as well because I won't need as much compound. Uh, also, I got the limitation on the DMSO concentration as well. So yeah, the more potent, the better for everything. I mean, the compounds that we're shipping um, are meant to be little clouds around each of these that give us confidence that we're looking at something real. So it's yeah. not just a single tone of something strange happening, you know, we've got something. Um, once once we establish that there is reality there, then building in solubility and things like that is, yeah, Perfect. Our day, it's our day job. Yeah, let's hope something, yeah. And I'll try, I will, I will also try some of the new hits that uh, Adrian has gotten anyway. I think the crystal has have grown already. So yeah, I might send another round at the end of June for the di for diamond. They are opening on the 23rd of June. Right. But I've got already crystals sent waiting. So <laughs> when they come back, I will send another round. And I'm trying and I will try to do K2 compounds as well. All right. Um I was going to uh, just ask you how to give us a very short summary of stuff he's doing. If anyone else had anything related to what we've been talking about so far to do with screening or crystallography. Okay, you hang did you want to share um, a slide? Um, we've only got a couple minutes left, but um, just to update people on what you're doing. Okay, sure. Uh, the multiple, multiple threads here. Yeah. Right. Can you guys see it? Yep. Just oh, the so, just the overview because that's all we have time for. I'm afraid. Okay. Right. The, the green ones. The green ones are the structures we have already achieved. Then I'm saving it. Saving this for protected version. Uh, uh. And once we decided to ship it, uh, we depot it. Uh, but for the for the general uh, that's for the comp comp gen seventeen. If you aren't uh familiar with this. Uh, then for the company in 2020, oh, sorry, the company in 22, uh, that's the, uh, I've, uh, the vocal coupling didn't work, but I managed to figure out some other coupling, uh, conditions, which may allow this coupling to work. Uh, I'm still working on this progress. And once it's been achieved, there will be easy protection afterwards. Uh, and for the rigid 87, uh, I'm having problem with getting the right condition uh, to, to work. Because the, uh, the focal coupling didn't work, uh, nor did the almond coupling. Uh, having a bit of problem here, but soon we'll figure out. Uh, still working on different conditions. Uh, yep, keep going. Funny. Okay, sure. Uh, then with the confirmation, uh, oh, sorry, confirming forty nine, uh, I've managed to make the I've managed to make the uh, sorry the uh, the pinnacle borel uh, substituted uh, intermediate, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the, uh, another two couplings. Then hopefully that will be done afterwards. Oh, that's the box protected version. So I would be protected anyway. And uh, here, here are the redesign, redesigned route to make gen uh, confusion three. 
This is basically uh, make a nitro here, then reduce it to the aiming. Uh, sorry, reduce it to the aiming. Yeah. Then make it a urea, then uh, coupling, then heat attacking. That's the rationale. Uh, I'm still working on the first first part. Um, then another redesign of the roots, trying to make the company control. It's basically uh, making a uh, reductive elimination, then uh, sorry, then the uh, sorry, then the AMI coupling, and the other one is making a urea form of the uh, boron. Uh, then this is the coupling. Then it's attacking. Uh, the last. The last bit was the most tricky one. I almost uh, I almost abandoned it because it was uh, too tricky at first. I didn't manage to design the whole thing, but later on I find out there's a potential route here. So it's the, uh, uh, the first starting with this cheap material, starting material. Uh, then my kids out uh, aldehyde here. Then using the uh, nitromethane. So that it could be uh, have that extra carbon. Then uh, at the same time, we'll prepare the urea form of the, this diamine. Then there's a a microcoupling condition being applied, and finally the reduction will give the rigid form. Let's see how it works. But yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Yang. So the idea is to try and get these compounds. Um, complete and evaluated because these were the first generation of uh, things that, that Jan was predicting. The idea, of course, is to then get data and then feed that back into a second round of predictions, right? So we're trying to, you know, keen to get initial, to... initial things done. Um, the Just the other things, because we're, we're going to run out of time. So just to update you on, on you Hang's currently looking at um, other variants of the, of the AZ compound, which um, are intended to promote accumulation. Uh, so different things versus what we had done with the amine compound. Um, if if you the Warwick guys were able to get the IC50s for the, versus the enzymes for Yuhang's amine compound, then he can he can complete that part of his thesis. Uh, just just waiting on the on the data for that. We know that they're not effective against wild type, but it'd be great to get the IC50s against the enzymes. Um, and then the last thing is in 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 talking with Joe, uh, putting together the, the key diagram for a proposal of the CC4 carb to get some more chemistry done. And Yuan's been working hard on 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 the summary diagram of what we're going to be asking them for, uh, and then we'll we'll put together a brief scaffold proposal around that. All right, that's a nano update from what we're doing. All right, any um, other business? We're nearly on the hour. Okay. If not, thanks for coming along. Thanks for sharing data, particularly to you, Adrian. Thanks very much. Um, we'll meet up again July second, second Tuesday of the month at two p.m. as usual, and we'll put the issue up. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank Good you. to see everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Here we go. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.